Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Everyone have nice holidays. Welcome back. I'm sorry I missed the last meeting. Uh, with that, I wanted to say that uh, uh, I understand on today's agenda, items eight and nine, I think Marty Cox uh, is in the building, but uh, the timing of this is, is he won't be available until around 11 o'clock. We actually just heard he is oh, yes. possibly available sooner, so, okay. yeah, so we can uh, we can get him down here a little sooner than that. Uh, with that said, why don't we start with the agenda. Uh, approval of meeting minutes from November 4th. I have read them and I move approval. I so second. Second. Um, any comments on that? Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? I, and I, was I, the, I was there, so I can, uh, I can still vote yes, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, regardless. And yeah, you can vote yes even if you weren't. Do we have any public comments? <laughs> Anybody uh, in the audience? No. Um, consent items. Uh, we have three items on consent and they're information items. Uh, Goody, if you want to um, hear from any of them, go over any individual ones or any questions or comments. Yes. Because I always keep my eye on the mini grant program, I have uh, just a couple of questions. So, is there? Hello. Hi. How are you? Great. Okay, I'm looking on page four on the big chart under the city of Oceanside, and I notice that the schedule is on the watch list. And my question is this: How do they expect to change their performance? in order to spend the rest of the funds with the extension because in the first one and a half <coughs> years they spent nine percent so how do they plan to spend 91 percent in the next one and a half years they actually if you look at the start date the start date was july 1st of 2015 so they spent nine percent in three months and they have okay. a year and nine months left Okay. And it's pretty <coughs> typical at the beginning of grants for them to be on the schedule watch list because they're just ramping up. Okay. That's basically all I have. Susan is how many, or maybe I should talk to the Sandex staff. How many extensions are considered normal, or is there such a thing? I mean, because this one on each on yes. any individual project. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that it's not. It has not been uncommon to have one extension. I think a lot. I, I think it's somewhere between 50 and 75 percent of our projects have had one extension. Some of those are administrative if they're less than six months or less, um, which we have two administrative extensions on this in this report, and then we have two that are coming to ITOC and to the transportation, I mean, sorry, for the, to the Regional Planning Committee. So it, it has not been unusual to have extensions. Um, there have been a few outliers that have had, you know, three, or so, three to five extensions, but those have been unusual. Okay, I just like to keep an eye when yeah. people ask for extensions. Sure. Thank you. Carolyn, that was the same question I have, so I think we'll do that. So. Great. With that said, uh, any any comments? More comments? Uh, can I get a motion to support that recommendation? Uh, I move oh. that we recommend okay. approval. Second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Reports, Mariana. Yeah, so um, with the usual item that we bring to you, <coughs> the actions that the Transportation Committee and the Board take since your November 4th meeting. The Transportation Committee met on November 6th and they discussed the proposed ballot measure. Um, I'm sorry, that was since you're not, yeah. So they, uh, the board actually directed staff to prepare a draft expenditure plan and the item is currently on the agenda for the Sandag Board of Directors retreat, March uh, 9th, 10th, and 11th. That's actually on the 10th, Thursday the 10th. Uh, staff is conducting outreach, so you probably will see some um, invitations or um, other material um, out there, so as a result. Um, at the November 20th board meeting, there were proposed changes to board policy number 31, clarifying the interest allocation rule, and that was approved and that was reviewed at your last meeting as well. You saw um, an item on your agenda at your November meeting. And then uh, the December 11th board meeting, staff provided updates on the EMP land management grant program and the 2015 plan of finance update, and both of those items are on your agenda today. No significant comments on either of those. I, Ariana, I had a question or just a comment about last year's uh, retreat mm -hmm. that ended up going and as well as Stuart and I felt that it was very worthwhile at the time just to listen to the discussions. And last year you had the ground table discussion on the future and different issues like that and, and I think you wanted to go <coughs> again but other issues as well and I don't know if uh, I'd like to encourage other board members to go if they can. I just wasn't sure if there's a Brown Act issue involved if, yeah. if more than two are down there. Correct. So if there's a quorum, then the ITOC meeting would have to be noticed, um, it, particularly if there's going to be any discussion. Right. So right. we would just uh, have to be careful with that. So just if you are planning on yeah, attending, let, if you could let, let me know, that would be great. Uh, if you're interested, let me know or let Ariana know. And mm -hmm. if, if like, maybe two of us could go, it would be great. I'm not sure of my schedule, but I, I think it makes sense to, uh, when is it? to do that. March 10th. March, is it March 10th, 11th? March 10th sure is the actual day. Uh, or if they spend the night, if, uh, how March 10th is the yeah, it's March 9th to the 11th, but the actual presentation um, that you're talking about is on the 10th. Correct. And where is it? Corona. Gary, any other comments on that? I know it's as far what? as I'm Look, I, I mean, the big focus this year is, you know, with the board having recently adopted the San Diego Forward Plan. You know the next big issue on the on the agenda is you know then the you know the, the resources to be able to implement the plan. Some of them are ongoing, and that's probably going to require you know new local resources. And so as the board contemplates whether November 2016 is the time they go back to the voters, that this retreat will probably almost all of it be centered around that kind of a discussion. So you know where's where's the Where's the board? Is this the, the right time? Uh, the expectation with the retreats is usually lots of discussion. We don't uh, necessarily expect a decision coming out of the retreat, but that sets up the board to make the decision, hopefully the following meeting. And one of the benefits of the retreat is that we don't only get the, the primary board members, but we get you know some of the alternates. So you know, there's uh, 100 <coughs> locally elected officials throughout San Diego County, the you know, councils and supervisors. And so, you know, we'll usually draw, you know, 30, 40, 50 of them there. So we, so it's also the broader reach in terms of, it's not just the direct Sandag board members, but it's their alternates and sometimes their second alternates. So it's a little broader, broader uh, uh, reach to all the elected officials of the 18 cities in the county. So and this year, again, the, the focus will be all around that we need to implement the, the plan that the board has adopted. So is there any, I talk to, to any uh, anything on the agenda at all related to Transnet that we that we cover, that we oversee at well, all on the um, agenda that day? Look, I, I just curious. You know, the, so there will be a fair amount, and you know, uh, the the team here, given the direction we've gotten from the board, or you know, we're we're doing a story map. So look back at because probably one of the things we, we probably haven't done well enough is uh, I would say even guys like me were surprised because we've been involved with so many of this but we're, we're, we're looking backwards to look at what did we tell the voters we were going to do with Transnet 1 and 
where we're at with this particular transmit measure and you know, what have we actually done with the, the money that the taxpayers paid. Uh, and so there's a storybook, and so we will spend some time, I think, looking at the retreat on, you know, sort of, you know, what, what's been accomplished, uh, what's yet to be accomplished. So in that sense, there'll be some look at Transnet. Uh, I started to say I was uh, personally a little surprised. Uh, uh, we, we've actually delivered about 650 projects region-wide, both, you know, everything from local streets and roads projects to, you know, major, uh, you know, freeway and transit projects. And so I, I must say even that number surprised me, having been involved with many, many <coughs> projects throughout the, the years. Um, the other thing that we hope to highlight uh, in these storybooks is, and, and I think one of the important in helping to educate is the importance that local dollars play in helping us leverage other dollars. So to the extent that we're successful or not successful, it's not just a, a direct uh, connection with, if, if we don't get local dollars, then we just miss out on those local projects. But very often we're leveraging those dollars and um, Jose and his team and Ariana uh, do a great job for us here, you know, trying to manage all the different colors of money. And what we see <coughs> in the state and federal government is that more of those dollars are starting to become more competitive, more, more performance-based rather than just formula-based. <coughs> And in all those competitions, usually local match becomes really important. And the best example, uh, Exhibit A right now, if I could, would be uh, the Midcoast project, which is, uh, when we're all said and done, at least a $2 billion uh, transportation investment for the San Diego region. Uh, one that I would argue is pretty important, connecting you know, major job centers uh, of downtown and UTC together, and connecting to the rest of the system. But it's not a $2 billion price tag, but it's expensive. And you know, about a billion of that do uh, that investment is going to be generated locally through Transnet. But we're going to get the other billion from the feds. Uh, and we're, uh, we think within months of finalizing what we call a full funding grant agreement that would commit the feds to the second billion dollars. Uh, but without the feds' second billion dollars, we can't build things like Transnet or like Midcoast. And I think if we <coughs> look forward you know, so there'll be some education to you know help everybody understand that it's not just the importance of the local dollar, but how that local dollar then helps San Diego uh, compete for some of these dollars either at the state or federal level, and other regions like you know Los Angeles and San Francisco and Contra Costa. And, you know there uh, you know there'll be several ballot issues uh, or measures on the ballot now in November, but to the extent that you know, other regions are successful. It also helps them be more competitive in going after the federal dollar. So it'll be a focus of the retreat on, you know, not just looking forward, but also looking backwards to hopefully uh, help us understand, you know, what we've actually done and how, you know, this premise of promises made, promises kept are, are important. We, but frankly, I'll share with the ITOC, I don't know that we've always done a good enough job of touting what we've gotten done. We've, our, our nature is to get on with this project and we stay, we get focused on the project that's in front of us. And so we now we are spending some time going back and highlighting 650 projects, uh, $14 billion investment, $4 billion locally, but it helped us leverage 10. I, want, I have a follow-up question for you, Gary. Is there anybody going to be speaking to the psychology of when you put an additional measure on the ballot. And the reason I'm asking you that is I'm thinking, you know, the news has been filled with the fact that the Chargers may or may not stay and they may want to vote. What, you know, I don't know enough about all the parameters, but if the Chargers request for public funded stadium is on the same ballot that you're asking for roads, is that good or bad? See, these are the things I don't know. Yeah, um, you know, one of the hopefully disciplines that we'll continue to keep here and uh, and that's that you know these 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 efforts uh, are pretty research driven. So you know we've done some uh, public research already. The numbers are way better than where we started in you know a year or two ago. But you know they're still a little soft in terms of having to get two out of every three voters. And uh, up to this point, Carolyn, I think our, our research uh, validates something that in, in, intuitively you're talking about. And intuitively we've been looking at that. You know, crowded ballots uh, make it tougher to pass these things. 
And so the more the more issues there are on the ballot, the tougher it is. Um, I, I would share with the committee that not only is that a challenge here locally, uh, but it's a challenge statewide uh, because of our initiative process. <coughs> the initiative process uh, and the number of signatures you got to gather through initiative is tied at a statewide level to the past gubernatorial election. And the last gubernatorial election having a historically low turnout when you know Governor Brown got elected to his you know, really fourth term, I guess, right? Uh, second term and his second stay at the, at, at, at the, at the governor's position. Uh, so the, the number of signatures you gotta gather is at an all time low. And so because you know people usually pay people to hang out at Home Depot's and Walmart's and other places like that to gather signatures. Uh, you know, there, we, we're, we're tracking statewide and uh, what we're hearing is there's a potential for actually 21 initiatives to be on the ballot <coughs> at the state level. So, so if you think about your ballot, when you go in and you, you deal with the national stuff and so the presidential election will be something that we're monitoring because that usually you know, generates higher voter turnout you have to go through all your federal stuff, all your state stuff, and then you get to your local stuff. And so it could be a very quiet, crowded ballot, and we are analyzing that, but so far the discipline that the board's had uh, is that you know we've, we've been pretty research driven, and for that reason, the board hasn't made a decision yet whether we're gonna go or not go, uh, and we expect that the earliest they would make that decision would be in March. Uh, the latest they could make that decision and still you know, do all the mechanics that we got to do. We'll probably be June, but but that that's being that's being thought through and researched and hopefully understood. So you know, it's not just we want to go because we want to go, but we want to go because we think there's a reasonable chance that we could be successful. Thank you. Well, while you and Kim are both here, I want to say uh, last year we did the performance audit. It was done a little bit differently than the years before in the sense it had some good summary pages of some of the, some of the highlights of, of uh, the last three years. And I thought uh, the overall report from the, from, from the group was very, very good at the year. So uh, keep going. Uh, thank you. But I wanted to say, folks, since you're both here, I think uh, that report showed it was on track. Items to continue on on the RTP amendment number nine. Michelle is here. And, uh, go ahead. Good morning. So, on its January 15, 2016 meeting, the Transportation Committee is scheduled to approve amendment number nine to the 2014 Regional Transportation Improvement Program or the RTIP. And the ITOC is asked to review and discuss the projects included in this proposed amendment, focusing their review on the TransNet funded projects. So, amendment number nine to the 2014 RTIP is a regular quarterly amendment and is detailed in the discuss discussion section of your report starting on page two. And this portion generally details the changes for each project, program, and transmit funds, and when applicable, provides the amount changed in funding. And so in attachment one of your backup, which begins on page six of your report, uh, you will find that the changes proposed in this amendment specifically <coughs> for the projects funded with transmit. And uh, each project includes transmit funding for the top of the um, project, and then followed by any other funding sources programmed on the project. And then we also show transmit subtotals and other subtotals to inform you of how much transmit and other funds are programmed. Any questions on the first two? Okay. Is this the correct time or the incorrect time to ask you a question about the maintenance and support costs that were mentioned on page four? for uh, MTS and NCTD. <coughs> are we on that? Which uh, item are you on? I think we're on a different Which item. Okay, are we, he had said number nine. Oh, no, we are oh, on. So okay, he said nine, <laughs> that's <laughs> I thought he was skipping. It's item okay. seven, but amendment number nine. nine. Oh, whoever yeah. has Amendment nine, seven. <laughs> seven. seven, amendment number nine. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, then all I can say is your, whoever really has this one, be forewarned, I'm gonna ask a question. <laughs> 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 all right, sorry, that's okay. So in attachment two, table two, as shown on page 38 of your report, uh, this provides a cumulative capacity analysis in regards to the revenue <coughs> program for the TransNet Local Street Improvement, or LSI funds. 
through Amendment 9 for all local agencies. Um, so as you as um, you made it noted before, any agency that falls below the 75% threshold, I've made a footnote at the bottom of the table uh, discussing why they are currently under the 75%. Any questions on this table? I had asked Ariana about, uh, uh, and Jose about uh, footnote number four about Carlsbad. Okay. I, as I guess it's uh, their, their banking to the funds for future projects. Is correct. That, uh, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of smaller cities are doing that. Correct. correct? Yeah. They want to hold on to it before they have a project. Because um, as far as the RTIP goes, you can't program the project unless it's fully funded for each phase. So if they don't have a fully funded phase, then they can't program it. Brad, I, I would share, I mean, if it's the right project, I mean, I think we encourage cities so that sometimes, you know, the larger projects might have a bigger bang for the buck, but you can't afford them all in one year. So our small cities sometimes do that. And for the right projects, we, we tend to encourage that so that hopefully they, they get the best project you can with these, with these limited dollars. They also, well, they can finance. They can finance you guys too, right? Up front. I mean, they can box, use the, the you bond, or commercial bond you. you guys have to get a, if they feel it makes sense. So some of the cities, I know where we've had them come before, before they said their, their capital won't support that alternative. So they just politically, you know, they made a choice. Yeah, some, some cities have chosen to take advantage of that and, you know, how we basically, uh, cities that have been successful in doing that, they, they take advantage of the commercial paper in the short run. And then to the extent that we can roll them into one of our larger bond issuances, because it probably doesn't make sense to go sell bonds for a really small amount for a city, but if we can roll them up into a larger bond issuance that we're doing, then that makes a lot more sense. And so people like Santee and uh, San Marcos, San Marcos uh, Lomisa, and Sanita, so Sambi have taken advantage of that. Uh, yes, sir. I, I'd like to ask a question, if I could, about page 30 of the enclosure, which is San Diego MPO SD70. This is the West Mission Bay Drive Bridge. Uh, we met with the city of San Diego, I believe, in November to ask them how they were going to increase their spending rate. And as you recall, and Carol had mentioned so properly, uh, we've got, they've got an awful lot of money budgeted for one project, which helps their expenditure rate go down. I believe this is that project. Am I, am I correct? That's the, that's the bridge over San Diego River? Yeah, mm -hmm. this is one of the major projects that they're going to be building right. transnet on. And so I'm just trying to understand what, the, what this is saying. It looks as if, what, uh, $6 million was transferred from, from <coughs> HBP to uh, local funds? Correct, they did lose some um, federal funding from, from the Highway Bridge Program. So in the <coughs> back, they actually added more local funds. And yeah. I think they'll be, they will be coming to ITOC with a request to borrow or to spend some more uh, transnet funds on this project. All right, well, if this local funds, is that transnet funds or is that their local general right funds? Right now, it'll be local general funds. It's kind of a placeholder. All right. And is this consistent with what they reported to us on in November? Um, the, these, this change in funding, uh, the, the dates. That I don't have the exact numbers in front of me for that, but I know that they had informed you that they would be spending more local funds on this project. And they, I they were that they're planning to dump a lot of their transnet money. Right. They were accumulating it, as they told us. So as part of the 2016 relief funds. As part of the 2016 RTIP update, they'll be updating their five-year CIP. So it'll probably be reflected into that. All right. Well, and, and just to note on this particular project, what they're changing it from local funds and the HPP, which are the federal funds, they're not changing the transnet funds. They're not changing at, their transnet funds. At least that I can funds. see. Right. It's just local. But wh which column or which which total under the total line? Which is their their transnet congestion relief funds? Is that L LSI yes. L LSI carryover? Correct. Funds? And L. And L. It's our old transnet. That's all. That's all that's transnet. All transnet. Right. And that's their money. That's, that's their money, yes. They're but they were going to spend $20 million, as I recall on it, was their plan. I, I'm just trying to understand this form. Um, 
this particular <coughs> item because it was important in their in their pl their plans to increase their rate of spending. Can we get more information to you on what the local funds yes. uh, are? You know, like uh, Michelle is saying, these are more of a placeholder at this time before they, they finalize the financial package for this project. It is one of their larger projects. Yes, I know um, it is. And they've they been were having some engineering discussions about how to do it. Right, and they've also been working with uh, Caltrans and uh, local assistance to get the highway bridge program funds. Oh, all right. Well, thank we, you. We can get more information. They also, City San Diego's also approached us on accessing the commercial paper program. The commercial paper program. I don't know program. if it's for this particular project or is it? I think there's the whole programming and financing of that is still It's still under up discussion. in the air, under yeah. discussion. Uh, but I think if you if you look at this project based on the number I'm looking at here is that look, ninety four million dollars of this are are you know, it's a what, hundred and eleven million dollar project? Yeah. So, you know, they're trying to use federal funds first. And I would just share with the committee that that's not inconsistent with what we would be doing if this was our own project. Is our strategy is to use other people's money first and, and leave ours for other things that we need to do. So, just my quick look at these numbers, it looks like they're trying to maximize the number of federal funds that they can get through the through the federal highway bridge replacement program, and, and then try to augment the rest with local funds and, and, and transnet funds. Yeah, but it looks like the, chal the challenge is that the federal funds can't come fast enough. You know, when I start construction, and construction windows a couple of years, federal funding is going to come over a number of years and not be complete till later on. So they they have a interim uh, funding thing, which is probably why they're asking. Yeah, and, and that's not. I mean, Mid Coast is probably a good example where you know they can go to the federal government and ask for what's known as a letter of no prejudice, right? That says, all right, I'm, I'm going to fund it up front, and then you know you're going to fund me afterwards. And so I suspect, haven't personally talked to them, but I suspect that's where they're looking at our commercial paper being a tool for them. <coughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I guess bottom line, Gary, you weren't here when they were when they were here, but they. They, they showed us that they were re increasing their spending of their yep. congestion relief funds, which we've been pushing them on. But they, but the Carol had mentioned that I seconded it. They had 20 million of it budgeted for this project, and I'm just saying, is this consistent mm -hmm. with what that 20 million dollar budget that they are expecting to spend? No. And, uh, because they want to save it. Everybody wants Transnet. If they could kidnap or counterfeit transnet dollars, <coughs> they'd love it because they can use it anywhere. There aren't as many rules. You take a federal dollar, yeah. you have rules that are as thick as the Webster's Dictionary. Yes. Yeah, and, and also part of what the city of San Diego told us is that instead of saving up, let's say, 20 million for this particular project yeah. and having that 20 million sit in the bank while they spend the money over, say, three or four years, they would just identify the funding that they they have plus the funding that they anticipate to have over a period of years and get more projects out uh, instead of just waiting to have all of that money um, in the bank ready to be spent. All right. And I, I would share, I mean, we, <coughs> the ITOX concern, it's a similar concern that we staff have when we see the transnet balances. So we, we have been encouraging the city, you know, the, spend their money, but I think cautiously also we want them to spend it wisely, right? Wisely, so yes. we don't want them to just run out and spend it and spend it on all the wrong things. And so we, we continue to push that. Uh, I would share that, you know, I am familiar that I, I think that the mayor's been trying to put in reforms that would streamline the city's process, right? So that they can hopefully get more projects out on the street. And uh, it's probably too early to say how successful that's been, but indications are that, that the city is moving forward to try to, to get stream, streamline you know their process. And you know a good example is that the way the city has done its, its its business, they really don't start working on something until they absolutely have all the money. And you know quite opposite of how we do things here, where you know we start getting a bunch of things ready, and then we're out hunting for dollars to try to make delta work and so we spend money sort of priming the pump to get projects ready so that when the opportunity comes we're ready to go and and in this competitive environment um, 
you know, if you're competing for state or federal dollars and, and you're saying, well, look, I don't, you know, I don't have my environmental document done, I don't have my design done, I still have all these issues, and, you know, from, from the time that somebody uh, says we want to do something to the time that you, you know, just get all the permits on a moderately complex job can easily be 10 years. So if you're competing for a dollar that's available today and you say, I've still got 10 years before I'm ready to use it, you're probably not going to be very competitive. So I, I do know that you know, the, 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 the mayor's been working at trying to streamline their, their processes so that they, they can better use their, their dollars. That's what they reported to us. Thanks, Karen. I have another question for anybody who can answer it. It's probably Jose. What, are they going to be using transnet dollars for the match of the federal funds? And what is that percentage? I believe for this program it's going to be 20. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? We do have to, uh, this is a discussion item, so no, uh, no requirements. Yet, so. Thank you. <coughs> well, Marty, we, we thought we were going to see you at 11, and your, your, your presence is a little early. That's great. Marty and uh, Richard and Ariana, a transnet plan of finance company. So this item, you'll see that at your seats you have a blue sheet, and so um, what that means is that we had a last minute change after the agenda was posted, and the reason for that, and I'll get into it in the report, is basically just that there we are proposing a budget amendment for the current fiscal year FY16 budget. Um, or by the board next week, so you'll want to refer to this report that's at your, at your seat. Um, so, so we're here to, uh, I'll start by introducing the team. Sarah, do you want to come up? Yeah. You know Richard, of course. <laughs> you know Marty, and you might recall Peter Schellenberg <coughs> from uh, prior years with PFM, Public Financial Management. So Darren Hodge is here with us today, but he's also, um, been working with us for a number of years um, as one of our investment bankers or as part of that team and now he has joined the PFM team so he has a lot of background and knowledge um, with regard to the Transnet program so welcome. Yeah. Um, so we're here to present the annual, annual uh, plan of finance update which is not to be confused with another item the last item on your agenda for today which is the transit operations plan of finance update so just want to to make sure that that's there <coughs> off the bat. I know it's a lot of plan of finances to keep track of. So, so we update the, the plan of finance every year, and you may recall that we were here just about a year ago with your last update. And as a reminder, the purpose is to update the cash and the cost assumptions. And we do this in conjunction with the SANDAG program budget updates. And this year's update is the usual and standard update that you've seen in years past as well and it maintains the course on the early action program of projects. And this is the Transnet Early Action Program map, which you've seen before, and with this we highlight many of the improvements that are completed or currently underway across the major corridors in the region. <coughs> For example, we've got improvements to State Route 76, a widening project. We continue with construction on the east segment and the final phase for that project, which is expected to be completed in 2017. Then in the Mid-City area, we have construction which just began in July on the region's first ever freeway level transit stations that connect Mid-City, <coughs> Downtown, and the Interstate 15. And then toward the west, Sandag has several low sand double tracking projects underway, including those that are being coordinated um, in, in conjunction with the construction of the Mid-Coast Corridor Transit Project. And then as we look south this summer, we completed the um, we completed the trolley renewal projects, which added new low floor trolleys, track and station platforms, and all of these to improve amenities and travel time. And then the region also has made significant project, uh, progress rather, on the bike early action program. And in spring, we completed construction of two high priority bike projects, including the first phase of the Bayshore Bikeway Segment 4, which you heard about at one of your recent meetings where we provided an update, in addition to the Plaza Bonita segment of the Sweetwater Bikeway, and then um, we recently began construction on the San Marcos to Vista segment of the Inland Rail Trail, and uh, that was in November. And then in addition, the Mid-Coast Corridor Transit Project, which is one of the lockbox projects from the original Transnet measure, that's included um, in the plan of finance as well, 
and we're making uh, steady progress toward receiving the full funding grant agreement on that project as well. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Richard, and he's going to give you um, an update on even more uh, project progress that's currently and on even more underway. Thank you. A lot of great progress this last year made possible by Transnet. This has probably been our one of our biggest years, definitely, as far as the, the diversity <coughs> across the region and, and scope of the improvements. Um, one of the low-cost improvements, but very effective for mobility, has been the Miramis Boulevard Traffic Signal Priority Measure Project. Uh, this is... Um, upgrading the traffic signals and controllers along their Mesa Boulevard so the new rapid 237 service uh, can have priority in getting through the intersections and, and uh, speeding up the, the route, uh, making it more efficient, more on time. Uh, so a lot of work replacing the controllers and the cabinets. A uh, similar effort is also underway along Claremont Mesa Boulevard. A lot of work um, up in North County in the Bonds of Fallbrook area, the 76 East project. This is widening and realigning State Route 76 between Mission Road and Interstate 15. Uh, you see the old two-lane roadway on the left-hand side, the new four-lane roadway being constructed on the right-hand side. Uh, a lot of grading and, and curve straightening associated with this project. Permitting was expedited because of the environmental mitigation program that's part of Transnet. Um, our ability to buy properties, restore them, uh, <coughs> creating the habitat that we're impacting, um, get our ratios taken care of with the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. A um, couple of the properties, this is the Vessels property, uh, the Groves, this Y Stray, you can see the new planting in, in the background there. Um, this was taken about a year ago. Uh, here's a more recent picture, the new vegetation is coming in nicely. A lot of this similar effort is, is going on the coastal corridor as well. Uh, we're buying properties and restoring them. This is the Hallmark property in the Awa Ediondo Lagoon. Left hand side is before, uh, after restoration, creating those lagoon habitats on the right hand side. Westbound Interstate 8 to northbound Interstate 5 connector. Uh, if you ever took westbound Interstate 8 in the morning or afternoon, that backs up and it's kind of awkward. It's in the median. Uh, or in the middle of uh, westbound 8. Uh, this was taken about a year ago. Uh, here's the new northbound lane, which has been relieving that, that westbound backup on Interstate 8. A lot of work going on I-5 Genesee, uh, to orient you a little bit, northbound Interstate 5 goes from left to right. Uh, this is UCSD campus here in the background. Uh, a lot of work at this, at this interchange. This gets really congested in the afternoons. See the new bridge being constructed there at Genesee. Trolley renewal wrapped up last year. Uh, we had a big ceremony, had a band of uh, youngsters come out from San Diego. Um, not to be outdone, our former chairman Jack Dale brought his backup uh, performers for his, uh, his presentation. Elvira to Marina double track, uh, work uh, occurring right now at the CP Rose location. A lot of this work has to be done at night. This is a very busy rail corridor. Uh, Amtrak service, BNSF freight service, as well as the, the coaster uh, commuter service on this corridor. New segment of the Bayshore Bikeway was completed. This is a stretch along Harbor Drive. A lot of work downtown along Broadway. Broadway is the end point for a lot of the new rapid service throughout the region. Uh, so getting new stations uh, constructed along Broadway. And here's a finished product over on 11th Avenue. Sona Valley Double Track Project, uh, replacing an old trestle timber bridge with a new concrete bridge and double tracking. A lot of work on Interstate 805 in the Sona Valley area. Uh, this is the north segment. A lot of lane widening going on, a lot of construction for the south-facing direct access ramp. The north-facing direct access ramp was completed last year. Uh, this project is, is wrapping up. A lot of impressive uh, retaining wall work as, as part of this project. Mid-City Mid Center Line Station and uh, putting a new rapid station in the median of uh, State Route 15 in the Mid-City area. A lot of column construction. As a platform uh, and walkway to get from uh, El Cajon Boulevard and University Avenue into the median of State Route 15. Uh, elevators will also be uh, constructed.
constructive <coughs> presentations. A lot of work down uh, on the border. Uh, State Route 11 is, is getting completed between State Route 125 and Enrico Fermi. That should open up later this month. And a lot of work also on the northbound uh, connectors um, here at the State Route 905, State Route 11, uh, State Route 125 interchange. Had a uh, groundbreaking groundbreaking ceremony for the northbound connectors last year. A lot of work to shore up the, the soils at those locations, get ready for the, the columns and bridges, the flyovers that need to be, that need to be constructed at these locations. And also a lot of work on Interstate 805 in Chula Vista, uh, wrapping up the Palomar Street direct access ramp. <coughs> this, going through, this is uh, going from south to north, left to right. Palomar Street direct access ramp. This graded area here will be the new transit center and the north facing direct access ramp, this location. Uh, we did the deck four, uh, number <coughs> 17, for the, the Palomar Street, new Palomar Street bridge. So, this is our checklist for where we're at with completion of projects that, that are outlined in the transit early action program. Uh, Dorian to the chart a little bit. Um, left hand column is <coughs> the name of the major corridors. Uh, red check means we've completed that phase of the project. So the majority of the projects we've got environmental clearance. Uh, regional bikeways are in a very sort of, uh, very state of accomplishment. Um, some of them have, are, are, are through construction, like the uh, photo I showed you of the Bayshore bikeway along Harbor Drive. Others are, are working on their environmental clearance. Um, most of the projects have already started construction. Um, regional bikeway is under construction. Midcoast Trolley has kind of started construction. Uh, utility relocation has started, and um, major construction should start later this year. Depending, of course, on the full funding grant agreement with the uh, Federal Transit Administration. And a lot of the projects open to public, um, partially open to public, are Interstate 805 HLE lanes and South Bay Rapid Service, State Route 76. Coaster double tracking, regional bikeways, and then uh, the two big projects that are getting ready to uh, enter construction Mid Coast Trolley and I 5 North Coast. One of the trends that we keep track of is the number of bidders we're getting on our projects. More bidders means better, <coughs> typically better prices for, our, for the work. Um, this chart shows we're still in that very healthy range between four and six bidders per project. This is a Caltrans statewide index on projects more than $5 million. Um, back during um, rapid escalation in prices, uh, we were getting less than four bidders per project in that 2005, 2006 time frame. Then during the Great Recession, we saw a lot of the private sector work come over to the public sector. Lots and lots of bidders on our projects. Um, but we're maintaining that, that healthy mix. Uh, we are seeing some price escalation. Um, but with that, I'm going to turn over to Marnie to talk a little more about the economics and financial details of the plant finance. Financial Maybe as a starting point here, um, in order to figure out how much money we have available, uh, as we estimate out, go through some of the assumptions that we use so that you understand what the basis of those forecasts are. Probably the most important one is the one at the bottom down here, the program revenues um, related to Transnet. Um, the estimates for Transnet come out of our regional growth forecast, which the board just recently adopted. Uh, uh, or the long-term uh, growth of San Diego. And so basically in there, there are growth rates for population, <coughs> employment, and housing units, and income, wages, salary, all that kind of stuff is in there. So we use those long-range <coughs> forecasts. Typically, sales tax revenue is pretty correlated with population rates of growth. So if you're good at estimating population rates of growth, you're probably going to get your sales tax revenues pretty close. And we've been uh, pretty good at producing estimates of population growth. So we have some amount of confidence in the sales tax growth as, as it relates to that. The other piece of the funding is, as everyone knows, we're, for every dollar we get in transnet revenue, we'd like to match that revenue with another state or federal. And that's the top assumption up there. And we use existing um, plans for federal state funds that would come in, nothing extraordinary by any means. As we know, the state struggles a little bit with uh, growth in, in revenue, and the federal has been uh, 
slightly growing, but almost flat over time. But we continue to match that with, with transmit revenue. And then the third piece up there is the middle one, the cost estimates. And those are the ones where we bring cost estimates for the um, projects that we'll do, both to the ITOC as well as the Transportation Committee and the board. So those are the three main assumptions, the revenue side and cost side. So <coughs> we're probably pretty familiar with all of them. And those are uh, create the basis for our, uh, our, our transit program. This next step here, walk us through a little bit about our expected revenues and costs over the long run. Let me do orientation here. The color itself, the red is the expenditure side of the program, that of any debt service. The gray part is the debt <coughs> service. And then that uh, line right at the top, sort of gold or orange color, is the revenue expected. And the reason that all of those are meshing so because we're planning to do it that way. Right? We don't want a lot of money hanging around that goes unused, and nor do we want to overspend, right? So the plans are sort of dictating us to act this way. In the front, the reason we created some bars, we have a little more understanding about those projects and the RTCIP. They have budgets to them, so we're a little more certain about that. As we get further out, we haven't done as much work on all those projects. We're putting in blocks in there. <laughs> give you an idea that we're all, you know, not as certain as we are at the front of the program. The big bump there at the beginning is related to the um, mid-coast and I-5 projects overall. A couple other things you can see, the orange um, block as we get further out begins to go up a little bit into the gray. As we pay off that long-term debt, there's more pay-go money available to us because it's not going to debt service anymore and instead would be able to fund projects on a pay-go basis. This next one gives you some idea about what kind of borrowing needs we'll have in the next uh, few years. And then actually, uh, Transnet will be tapped out, the major corridor program, in terms of its borrowing capability, <coughs> will be tapped out at the end of this program. Again, the color orientation, the red is really major uh, <coughs> corridor programs, the blue part is the environmental <coughs> mitigation program, and then uh, the gold is the bike uh, program we have. So we have borrowing plans <coughs> for all of those. So you can see by 2022, 23, somewhere in that time period, we're done with our borrowing program. Any transnet expenditures that I showed beyond that are really on a pay-go basis as opposed to with borrowing funds. <coughs> and on the right over there in that uh, table, you can see sort of sources uh, of um, the bond proceeds. One I want to mention is the TIFIA program. The reason for it is relatively new to us. And the reason we thought it was important is because TIFIA os offers a lot of both flexibility and beneficial borrowing terms when you do it. For example, they offer an interest rate that's usually one basis point over long-term treasuries, really competitive rates. The second thing is, is that they offer, when you borrow money from them, the opportunity to forego any payment for the first five years. That's different than if you borrow <coughs> uh, the private sector, even though it's tax exempt, you still got to start paying on that stuff immediately. So there's flexibility there. Then the other piece is, is that when you borrow from them, they're also willing to take a second seat, meaning they don't want uh, primary coverage. And that's important to the bond market. Market, everybody wants to be paid off first for their bonds. Tiffy is willing to take a, take a second seat. This helps us with our rating. So we have, that's really the third part of why the Tiffy program is very important to us. We'd like to maintain our AAA rating as far as we can into the future, even though you know we continue to borrow more and more funds to, to build these projects. Tiffy allows us to do that for an extended period of time, reduces our cost. <coughs> so we were thinking about doing more TIFIA, perhaps an I-5 program. I you know uh, if and when we build the third border crossing, we're looking at TIFIA down there. Different reasons there, it's got to do with the flexibility of payment back and the ramp up time period necessary to get that third border crossing off the ground. Um, and with that, uh, if there are no questions, let me turn it back over there. Uh, if there are no there are questions. <laughs> Here's what I wanted to know. Uh, for this nice TIFIA 
program, does it cost you any more when you're paying back? In other words, it sounds so perfect. Usually when it sounds perfect, there's something else about it. Like, does it cost more? The answer <coughs> that is no, there isn't, but I agree with you. It's always worth being, um, you know, the federal government's sometimes tough to deal with. <coughs> they're, like you said earlier, right, if you spend a dollar of their money, the rules and regulations are a little different than the, than the local stuff. But in this particular case, this program has now been broadened out in terms of how you can use its money. It originally was destined for very risky project, last dollar in, but otherwise wouldn't be built. Toll roads are a good example of that. But they broadened it out now so you can use it for different types of projects. So provided you can pay back the loan, right, they're willing to provide you very, very, not only cost competitive, but flexible uh, payment schedules to do that. For us, this helps us balance our, our expenditures over time. So in the event that there are movements either on the revenue side or cost side for us, we have an additional shock absorber, the TIFIA program, that helps us balance our budget over time as, as we move forward. So for our program, especially in light of the fact that we're coming near the end of our borrowing component for the major uh, quarter program, adds a lot of flexibility to it. So this is, this is a really good program for us. Can I have another question? One last thing I would add to maybe raise the committee's comfort level in terms of TIFIA. This is not brand new to Sandag, so we are already a, uh, uh, they're already a, a lender to us on the toll road. So we, we, over the last four or five years, we've gained, I think, a fair amount of experience in working with their room and TIFIA. And to Marnie's point, it's, it, it, first, the, the, the rates are competitive, but then they're patient. They don't need to be first. They know they're going to get paid. They're going to get it out of the No, it sounds order. wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that's, that's what's, you know, flags went up. It sounds good. Yeah. And I think okay. that patience, particularly when we have uh, what I would characterize as two mega projects on our horizon, mid coast and the north coast quarter projects, those are big cash hogs. And to Marty's point, this really serves as a really nice shock absorber. And we, at the, the, the staff <coughs> Know, pretty confident because we, we do have some experience um, <coughs> and, and that cuts both ways. I think the fact that we got experience, uh, you know, we're about to go back to the rating agencies on the toll road. Uh, we're optimistic that we hopefully are going to get <coughs> rating on the toll road race because our uh, management and our decisions on the toll road have actually been pretty positive. Uh, we're one of the only toll roads in the country where we've actually lowered toll rates, so <laughs> we've made more money. Yeah, that's right. I mean, All right, so that's a little that's a little bit of an oxymoron. In most places, they're raising tolls, and we actually lowered them, but we got more people to use it, and the toll road's performing pretty well. So I think that also will bode well for us uh, when we're back at, at the federal government. That they've also got experience with us. Okay, I had I feel really badly because both Richard and Stuart aren't here today, and you know how good they are with the finances. So I'm going to put in my right-of-way, you know, kinds of words, a question that they might ask, but it would be much more sophisticated from them. Do you know how both of these gentlemen are always concerned that as you go out and they see what's happening, that maybe because you're doing this based on knowledge that you have today and everything else is based on a future idea, not a fact, they're concerned, at least they have been in the past, that there isn't going to be enough ultimately to pay off because of whatever assumptions we've made now. How would you respond? Well, I, the first thing I'd point to is we have coverage ratios on all of this borrowing that we're doing. And so right now, as that one of the slides there, the minimum um, sort of coverage <coughs> ratio is 2.36, is as low as it goes. We have twice as much, you know, 2.3 times as much money money necessary to pay back the debt than is, than is warranted. And then as we go on and we continue to pay that, a little money frees up, right? Because we okay. still have it. And that's how that pay go uh, works, okay, right? Okay, So we have the program is viable in that sense. Money is available to spend it. The second point, <coughs> are you sure you're gonna be able to afford the debt in the long run? And that's that coverage ratio. And those are, the, those are the same questions that the rating agencies make sure that we do it. That's the only reason they give us a AAA rating, right, is that they mm -hmm. want to make sure we can pay that debt service too. So they're as concerned as anybody on I talk about that process because, you know, in the past, or 
what typically goes out uh, to potential um, purchases of our debt, right, is to make sure that if the life insurance company or the pension funds or wherever it might be buy our debt, that they're actually assured that they're going to get that revenue back. So that, that's, what this, that's what that rating is all about. Thank you. I could, I mean, so this kind of represents what we assume is sort of going to be the limit of our borrowing. Can we go one slide backwards? That's what that, I'm that stuff that's in solid orange. That's the revenues, and so we don't, we don't. I mean, even if we and, and the way we've structured our debt when we've gone back, it's we've we've done with the with the uh, financial community. We've looked at level debt service. debt service and level revenue service. So. You know, we've assumed like the absolute worst, uh, and so, but all that stuff that's in orange then becomes the cushion to make sure you're going to be able to pay your debt back because, and, and, and the way that that works is because the money goes to a trustee first. The trustee pays all the debts <coughs> before any money comes to either, you know, the aggressive sandbag staff or the grubby spending politicians, right? So the the, 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 the trustee pays all the debts first before the money comes here for us to spend. So, you know, I, I, I think that's what all those coverages lead you to believe is that there's actually plenty of money to pay our, yeah. our debts back. Not only is a level debt service, so that you, just like on your mortgage, you know what your mortgage payment is over time. The second piece that the rating agency does, it assumes no growth in your tax, in your tax rate. So you have to be able to pay for it from that day one. See, I didn't know that. Even though it goes up, right, over time. They, assume, they hold a constant. So those coverage ratios are a function of that. So, you know, it's, again, it's, it's providing security to those potential buyers of our debt, right, that we actually can do what they want. So these are the sort of the rules that we, uh, we participate in. I just have to comment and say that, uh, from my opinion, I think that Marnie is especially gifted to be able to explain things that are, I know, very complex. She <coughs> does it so that a person who's in preschool like me in finance can get it. I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. He's, our, he's our secret weapon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, I had a question, Mark. I, the, uh, I'm always interested in hearing about what, what's happening in Washington. Of course, the federal highway bill was passed, and that's a five, I believe, five years. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that? And also the step at the state level, like, like reading in here on the update, the revenue assumptions, there's a little red flag as a possibility of some uh, <coughs> increases in step. So I know it's a shorter term, sort of, but not 30 years out. But how, um, how do we see the state federal issues yeah. coming in? Um, you want me to go through my speaking points? That might help answer at least the stick piece. Sure. And then do you, you want to answer the Washington no, no. question? Oh, first yeah, I was going to say, I'm probably not the best person to answer the Washington question. Kim Aguirre. Probably. That's a good point. I just, uh, yeah. I always look at you, Mike, for first. <laughs> yeah, <that's okay. laughs> I told you, you got the gift, boy. Right? You got the gift. <laughs> on, the, on, the, on the federal funding, so yeah. um, Congress and the, the FAST Act, the long term five year federal service transportation authorization was just passed uh, into law, which is good news. I'd say overall, big picture, um, over the five years, over, you know, about a 5% increase in funding. But depending on the programs, different levels of funding. On the, on the public transit side, actually those funding levels, the funding increases for both the formula funds, um, it's slightly higher, I'd say closer to 8 to 10% growth, in, which is good news in terms of on the transit side. There's also uh, some competitive funding for replacement of On the highway side, about, I'd like say, 5% increase overall. Um, so good news in terms of um, some, at least a stable funding source over um, the next five years. We would, we would like to see more, of course, but at least there's some certainty in the, in the federal funding, which is good news. I think it's at least raised the issue um, and gotten some attention at the federal level. After, you know, I don't know how many. I, I lost count of the number of uh, that point. I would add to what Kim talked about is for the first time in this new federal bill, uh, one of the emphasis areas is, is freight. So there's actually a freight program. First time in the past, freight had to compete with everything else. There's a, a dedicated freight program. Um, and, 
you know, being ready, you know, being good, and probably mostly being lucky makes all the difference in the world. And so as this new program comes on, our border crossing, which, um, you know, we, I think, made a pretty effective case that the, that the importance that that border crossing has, not only to us here locally, but really why that's of national interest. And, and to, to at least share with the committee a couple of data points, there's um, at least 25 states today that trade over a billion dollars with Mexico. Uh, Mexico continues to be a very important trading partner. Uh, one of the reasons that people like myself and Marnie and others are so bullish on the Mexico trade too <coughs> is that when we buy a product from China, the American content in that product is typically in the range of one to two percent. So 98 percent of that product got made by all of it in China or other parts of the world, but only two percent American <coughs> content. When we buy a product from Mexico, 40% of the Mexican content product that gets imported in the United States is a U.S. component. So, so there's, there's, there's benefits both on the export market and there's big benefits on the import <coughs> market because of the Mexico piece. So, so the border crossing becomes pretty competitive. Uh, the, the, there's a, a high economic dialogue process that has been established through commerce where the two countries talk about the, our border crossing is on the agenda of the high economic dialogue. And so we think that our border crossing is probably like the prime, one of the prime candidates of where the feds ought to invest with these new freight dollars. And so I think in that sense, we're sort of at the right place at the right time with the right project. So we're, we're, we're ready, uh, it's a really good project and kind of we're lucky to be where we're at. And so that's sort of our, our, our big pitch right now is, you know, how do we take advantage of those federal funds to fund this very important national project that would benefit <coughs> right, San Diego more than everybody, but the nation as a whole. And then second of that, so the way we plan projects and looking at a corridor basis, the Low Sand Corridor, which is the second busiest rail corridor, but also freight corridor. That's, that's a rail line where we also move freight. And we've got, um, look, I don't know if the gentleman comes in here, but we got right. someplace, we, we've got close to uh, three, four hundred million dollars of projects that are somewhere in the pipeline, so actually a little bit more than that, that are pretty close to being ready. So back to being ready. Um, so uh, as uh, Commissioner Medapper just got back from uh, the TRB conference, the Nerdy Convention in, in Washington, uh, he's been helping us and we've been working uh, to position the San Diego freight projects for this new program, which uh, feds are probably going to be looking to push money out quickly, but they all want, also want success stories, right? They want to push out money and then have the bridges to nowhere. And so we think our border crossing project, more than anything, is, like I said, at the right place at the right time. And that's, that's on the federal side. And then, We'll let Ariana say more and we can talk a little bit about uh, this, what's <laughs> happening on the state side. Um, did you have something? Yeah, what, just one more comment back to the point about, you know, the plan of finance. The multi-year bills that the federal government <coughs> is very important to us, right, because if they're annual, right, that, then Jose, when he tries to figure out what they're going to do the next few years, we're basically, you know, figuring out what they've done in the past. So with multi-year, a little bit of certainty to the revenue side of our equation, <coughs> so that, that's important for us, too. So just to summarize what uh, Marty uh, just stated, so we do have the capacity in the plan to meet the needs of the program through 2048 when the ordinance expires, and we also um, are covering the principal and interest obligations on our debt as we promised to the bondholders. And so the plan assumes a state program funds consistent with the latest STIP fund estimate, and to address your comment, um, at the November board meeting, staff did present an item regarding the California Transportation Commission and how the commission is encouraging projects that are programmed with STIP dollars to be pushed out to the outer years of the program, and that's due to the absence of funding capacity as is stated in the report. So it's important to know that while the plan of finance update does accommodate the current cost estimates, 
for the EAP projects, the plan can also accommodate the possibility of having to advance transnet or other funding in lieu of STIP dollars to keep the North Coast Corridor program on schedule until the STIP outcome is better known. And so this is also consistent with our cash management practices here at SANDAG, and we continue to seek out other state and new federal authorization funding to keep the board's EAP projects on track, as Kim and Gary alluded to uh, or spoke about. It um, should also be noted that while some of the EAP projects in your report do show variances as compared to the fiscal year 2016 uh, budget uh, uh, approved, there's only one budget amendment, as I mentioned at the beginning, that's part of the blue sheet item um, for this uh, current fiscal year, and that's the Oceanside Station pass-through track, and, um, and that is reflecting uh, an updated cost to complete and that is scheduled for board approval, uh, the award of construction is scheduled for board approval next week. So um, for other projects, staff is going to be returning to future meetings with budget amendments on a project by project basis. And that's in an effort for us to continue maximizing each of our, our transnet dollars. Um, and then uh, we will continue working closely with our SANDEC financial advisor, of course, as we always do, to pursue cost-effective financing strategies such as TIFIA that Marnie spoke about. Um, that will help continue to increase the program's flexibility and complement our traditional sales tax, which we anticipate the next bond issuance in summer 2016. So we'll be coming back with that at a later date. And in terms of the recommendation for you, the ITOC is asked to recommend that the Board of Directors approve the 2015 Transnet Plan of Finance update. Rather, if we could go back, because we didn't answer your question. Sort of there. Okay, so you, you yeah. satisfied because there's three yeah. different, so the, you know, the governor's uh, special session on transportation so far has yielded now three proposals, one from the governor, one from the Senate, <coughs> one from the Senate, a range in uh, magnitude from $3 billion per year of new revenue to about $8 billion of revenue per year. All of them require new fees or new taxes of some type. They're trying to do this legislatively, so they require a two-thirds vote of the legislature to do that. There's some complexities in figuring out how they get there, but I think there's a reasonable chance of something that can come out of the state system. And the one thing we would leave with the ITOC, and, uh, and we've been agitators for this, uh, sometimes in a positive way, sometimes not in so positive ways, but is that debate's gone on in Sacramento to not leave our local cities and county out. So right now, all the proposals have some of the money going to the local street and roads that would help you know, our county meet some of the needs that it has in the unincorporated area, <coughs> but also help our cities, in, in particular the city of San Diego as it tries to, to grapple with this big sort of infrastructure challenge. Uh, you know, we've managed to Prickly educate, educate, <coughs> educate enough that in all three proposals, uh, roughly half of the new money would go to cities and counties, which I think would, would help San Diego quite a bit. Just for my clarification, on page 10, the funded through, I don't want to take a guess, I have an idea, but I don't want to embarrass myself. Wrong thing. Like FED and RTA. And so at the bottom of page 11 in that so chart, not go far enough. it'll say, you know, PE preliminary engineering, PEB, draft environmental document, and so forth. So one of them that's near and dear to my heart is the Sandy to Lagoon. What, what are they doing? Talking about the double tracking project? Yeah, the double track, uh, it's in the Lagoon double tracking platform. Yeah. So, so we're, we're in the process of finishing up the environmental work uh, with, with the beds at a programmatic level. And I think we're recently, uh, we've got to get those approved through FRA. And uh, I think we recently uh, reached the point where we're achieving what's known as of finding a no significant impact. And I think then that money helps us move the design further. Um, and I 
again, we're trying to position that project so that it's ready to compete uh, because the, the really can't get the platform done without actually dealing with the bridge. They, they kind of are a package deal because uh, that's part of the area where we, we have a single track. And, you know, they're not going to let us uh, stop to load people off at the fairground with just one track and because of the, the flood plane levels and other things. It's a pretty expensive project. I forget the exact numbers, but I think it's on the magnitude of about $150 million total cost to replace the bridge and build a platform. 170. It's 170. Okay. Thank you, <laughs> Going up. Uh, and so what we're trying to do here is, you know, kind of kind of like, like the border crossing, get it as ready as we can so that when an opportunity comes either at the state or federal level, uh, we might be in a position to take advantage of that to get funds to actually build a bridge and, and build a platform. And, and Jim can correct me if I'm wrong, but the nine million represents getting through final environmental document and there's other funds for design. It's just not expected that nine million will get us all the way through design. But it's more than we need for environmental. There's about three and a half, three point six million for the design phase. I think right now the goal is to get it to sixty percent design. So there's part of the part of the funds for an environmental phase and then part for one of the reasons it's so expensive is because the bridge is out there is going to be replaced. Yeah. It's going to it's a short bridge, it's going to be replaced with a very long bridge and then a matching bridge right next to it to span the little bit from that title. Mm -hmm. That project stay on this early action program for the duration. So the four quarters are the early action program and then so we add or subtract you know, projects as we within that quarter as we are successful at hunting for dollars. And this is part of the promise that, <clears throat> excuse me, Sam Dag made to the voters that they would do certain projects early and get them completed so the money just doesn't languish over a lot of years, but you don't see much on the ground. Thank you. Uh, my only comment, I'm very pleased with this plan of finance and the way it's been presented to us. Um, I, I also am pleased with your, your borrowing schedule. We are obviously trying to make hay while the sun shines yes. with these low interest rates that we've got. And therefore, I, I move that we uh, recommend approval of this of this plan of finance. Second. Carolyn, you have comments? No, I just w I was hoping that someone would second. Yeah, <laughs> Page eight, where is that in, of the report to the projected sales tax revenues? I guess I was looking at what was in the 2014 plan of finance versus the 2015. And it's interesting that the actual for 2015 went down, but then the projected going forward is increased. It is, I mean, I see in the description there's a variety of factors, but I guess just in. Yeah. in <laughs> okay. this, this was where I'll kind of fail when Carolyn said I'm able to explain things. <laughs> There's actually two things going on here that are important. So the first one is if you take a look at the plan of finance for 14, a um, little higher rates of growth as we, as we, uh, sorry, 15 little higher rates of growth than what we had before. So you go back and think about what was going on <coughs> at that time. Actually, the U.S. really hadn't started to turn around yet. And so much of the things that we use to determine what goes on in San Diego actually initiates at the national <coughs> and national level, and they sort of filter through to us. So at this point, things were, weren't looking as good. So I would say that things turned around a little bit. It's actually, it's very important for employment growth to occur. So since 2012 or so here in San Diego, we're we going to go back to when we're doing this versus what data is in front of us. Employment growth has been exceptional in San Diego, much higher than what's going on at the national level. And typically when you have job growth, you get population growth, when you have population <coughs> growth, you get sales tax growth. Well, there appears to be a little bit of a short circuit going on today. <laughs> um, we're getting the employment growth, population growth is, is responding, but the sales tax growth is not. 
we're still we're tracking today right around three and a half percent. So we've come off of a recession which we were close to nine percent the first year coming out, and have slowly declined virtually every year to this one. And employment is actually the opposite kind of trend. Right? We came out relatively slow, even though we had nine percent rate of growth in in sales tax revenue. But we've seen an acceleration in employment growth, but a continuously slowdown in the rate of growth in sales tax revenue. That's a little reverse of, of what we originally thought. So if your traditional way of thinking doesn't work, you have to sort of dig a little deeper. And we think there are actually two things that are going on today to help, help explain this. First of all, there was a, um, a decline in the purchasing power of the peso and an increase in taxes in in Mexico in general, but in Tijuana specifically. We think that has had an impact, especially on South Bay sales tax, with Mexican residents coming across the border not having as much money as what they've had in the past. And the second thing that may be going on is, is that although San Diego is getting a lot of job growth, we think some people are deciding to live in Riverside. Single family units are tough to come by uh, for two reasons. One, we're not building very but the second reason, all the foreclosures we went through, a majority of that stock went over to the rental side, not to the for sale side. So there's actually a sort of a shortage of that. The immediate inventory for that, if you can't get through the regulatory process to produce the single family unit that's in demand, is actually in Riverside. So a combination of things that are going on here, right, which would account for employment <coughs> going up, but sales tax revenue expenditures are taking place where people live as opposed to where they work, and that would account for the relative uh, low rates of growth. The last part, which I also, also think is important but affects everywhere, and that is wages really have not begun to pick up with the exception of the group at the very high level, um, you know, the top 10% um, of income earners. Everybody else is either stagnant or going down. So again, that wouldn't give you a lot of, but usually that's different. Employment growth going up, you would normally see wages going up because things get tight, you know, people are willing to pay. That, that hasn't happened. <coughs> Maybe the construction is a little bit different because of the rate of growth in the construction industry sort of this past year has been excess of 10%. That's a big impact on a rate of growth, so maybe some shortages are beginning to occur, so some labor items, right? Whether it's drywall hangers or whatever it might be, maybe some of the specialty skills We've seen increases, and that's what we're, Richard was referring to a little bit earlier. We're beginning to see the inklings of some of those increases. But as you all know, at the international level, both from a commodity side, right, copper, uh, all of those components that go into the construction stuff are actually at almost all-time lows and are continuing uh, to see lower amounts. Groups who, uh, countries who provide all that, the, Argentinas and the Brazils and the Russias and places like that are all facing uphill. If they're not in recessions right now, they're headed to them. So there's there's a lot of turmoil <laughs> going on out there. And so some of the numbers, <coughs> right, you're seeing here probably don't reflect traditional trends, right, that you've seen. So I hope, you know, some of my explanation hits home to, to why you see rates of change here a little bit different than what we've seen in the past. And I think that's, that's why the discipline of updating this on a regular basis, if not annually, so that we're, you know, we're, I think we do a pretty good job of forecasting, but it's, you know, we're, we're forecasting, so right. that's why by updating it every year, uh, we hope, hope that we can, you know, make corrections as we go year by year so we don't get ourselves in trouble. Discussion. Thank you, Tim, very much. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion and a second to uh, recommend, recommend, make a recommendation to support the item. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposition? Abstention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Transnet Transit Operations Plan of Finance. Two T's. Brian? Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Good morning. 
So this is the first time the Transit Operations Plan of Finance and accompanying finance model is being presented to the ITOC. Uh, before the I-15 in Mid-City Rapids started in 2014, only the Superloop had been in operation. This plan of finance model was constructed with the help of a consultant in 2009, but has been extensively modified over the last year with coordination <coughs> from MTS and NCTD and with technical assistance from Sandex Technical Services Department. I will provide a summary of the services included in the plan of finance, review the assumptions used to estimate the operations, costs, <coughs> and revenues, provide a summary of the total costs and revenues, and then in some sensitivity runs, describe how small changes to various assumptions can change the total net balance. The plan of finance is a dynamic tool that will be regularly updated and monitored. The transit ordinance extension sets aside 8.1% for the operations of transit services described in the transit capital improvement program. Seven new routes as well as frequency enhancements on three existing routes are included in this funding. Superloop, Mid-City, I-15, and Mira Mesa Rapid are the four existing services with the South Bay Rapid and Mid-Coast Trolley committed to begin in the next few years. Plan services include the South Bay Rapid Express from San Jacinto to Serna Mesa, and then there are frequency increases on the Blue Line Coaster and Sprinter. I'll provide a brief summary and ridership update for the four rapid services currently in operation and then jump into the details of the model. So here we have the Superloop Rapid in the UTC area, and it was implemented in 2009 with about three to 4,000 riders each weekday. And with the implementation of the U-Pass at UC San Diego has grown 200% to uh, over 10,000 riders a day currently. The Mid-City Rapid from SDSU to downtown started in October of 2014 with roughly 5,500 riders a day and has grown by about 27% to over 7,000 a day currently. And then our uh, rapid routes on the I-15. Uh, um, there's the 235 I-15 Rapid from Escondido all the way to downtown started in June 2014 with roughly 3,400 riders a day and that has grown to over 5,000 a day, uh, about a 47% increase. And then the 237 Mira Mesa Rapid from Rancho Bernardo to UC San Diego via Mira Mesa Boulevard started in October of 2014 with roughly 575 riders a day and has grown 74% to over 1,000 a day. So these are just some um, screenshots from our model file used for illustration purposes only. Don't try and read all the small print on those. But the plan of finance model <coughs> is a complex spreadsheet tool refined over the past couple of years to include the four rapid routes, actual costs, and fair revenues, refine the future services based on these actuals, and then also been developed in coordination with the finance managers from MTS and NCTD. So the four main variables used in the model are operating costs, maintenance and support costs, fair revenues, and transnet revenues. The cost to operate a route are calculated by using the cost to operate the route per hour or mile and multiplying it by the annual number of revenue hours or miles needed to run the service. Costs for planned services are based on current year costs to run similar services and then inflated for future years. Projected inflation rates have been developed in coordination with both MTS and NCTD based on historical inflation rates at their agencies. Maintenance and support costs includes, among other items, extra station and right-of-way maintenance, traffic signal priority maintenance, security, utilities, marketing, administration. And then the amount of fare revenues for each route is calculated by using the average <coughs> fare by service type multiplied by the number of anticipated passengers riding each year. And then finally, updated 8.1% transnet sales tax revenues are provided from Sandex transnet and finance departments each year. We heard about that extensively from Marnie in the last item. So through <coughs> 2048, the operations and maintenance costs minus fare revenues gives us the total net cost of $1.8 billion. Future year's amounts are year of expenditure dollars based on the inflation rates discussed previously. The estimated transnet revenues is $1.71 billion for a difference of about $82 million, which is less than a 5% difference of the total program's cost. The first negative year is not until 2043, 27 years from now. So while the difference of $82 million seems like a lot, we feel that the health of the plan, plan of finance is sound. Uh, there are numerous ways in which actual costs or revenues may change over the next 30-something years that could have various results, some of which could close that gap to an even amount. I'll go through an example of uh, some of these. Um, these are kind of a couple next slides are a little busy, but the, the main idea that if cost, for example, were to operate uh, or inflate each year at 90% of what is assumed currently, there could be a surplus in 2048 if the cost were to um, inflate at, or that was a inflate at each year at 90% of what we have. If they were inflate at 10% more than what you're assuming at 110%, there would be a deficit in 2048. Um, 
another busy slide, and I apologize, but another potential alternative would be if sales tax revenues <coughs> increased more than assumed, if they rose 10% quicker than projected. For example, a 5.5% annual growth rate instead of 5%, there'd be a $76 million surplus. Or if they were to grow by 10% less than the original assumption, there'd be a deficit of $240 million in 2048. Uh, but to reflect the discipline of the Transnet Major Corridors Plan of Finance, the Transit Operations Plan of Finance will be brought back each year to the Transportation Committee, ITOC, and the Board of Directors. If any of the assumptions reviewed in this report change significantly, the Plan of Finance can be brought back immediately for review and approval. This is a slice in time and is our best estimate of costs and revenues over the next 32 years. The finance, Plan of Finance model is a dynamic tool that will be regularly updated and monitored. And so the ITOC is asked to recommend that the Board of Directors approve the 2015 Transnet Transit Operations Plan of Finance. That concludes our presentation. That concludes our presentation. Any comments? Carol, just oh, go on. Go on. I mean, just to be clear, that based on the everything we know today, the best, best projection of what we know now, that 82 million deficit is, is the cumulative at 32 years out or something, right? Right. So, okay, I, I, so I, I since I sort of like to deal in the present, <laughs> I think we brought this question up to someone when they, you know, were presenting the information about transit a few months ago. But my question is this: What percent increase would you need in ridership to <coughs> break even? To get us to that. I mean, uh, I know that you gave us things like okay, right. if, if revenues increase or something else decreases, but I'm just saying, no, let's talk about now. For what you know, how much of an increase in ridership percentage-wise do you need to break up even? I mean, just a guess, I'm maybe like a 10% increase, not a whole lot. It's surprising all the little tweaks here and there of what can happen. So and the, the ridership's all modeled ridership from our, our uh, ABM model, so it's still a guess out. We'd run a 2020, 2035, 2050 runs on <coughs> anticipated ridership, so it varies, but yeah, it's not okay. a whole lot. I, I, should, I need to get back to you on that. Okay, actually. My, then my other questions related to that would be, what are you doing to increase ridership marketing or, or whatever? Also, how many of the tickets that are being purchased are discounted percentage-wise? So, that's, so marketing, they've done a, a huge job of marketing all the services. Um, commercials, they had big days with free rides, things like that. So I think they've done a great job there. And you can see on like the 237 Rapid, uh, ridership wasn't that great at the beginning. So they went out, surveyed a bunch on those routes to try and figure out who rides, who's riding the other routes, talked to people at UC San Diego um, to see what they could do. And ridership's you know almost doubled in the last six months on that. Um, Ticket or discounted rides, that's a tougher one. UC San Diego for the 237 <coughs> pass there, U pass, which has added a whole lot of ridership to the Superloop and the 237. Um, that's a universal pass now to the students there that they pay for, but every student can ride all transit in San Diego on that. Do, um, we, do we, meaning the taxpayers, get a return on that? Or we do. So they negotiated, the MTS negotiated the rate with UC San Diego on what they would charge the students any rides on Superloop and 237 or any uh, transnet route is uh, attributed to the, our funding and subtracted off the top. So that is definitely, so that's been a help as well for that. And then other discounts, I mean, there's the normal senior disabled Medicare discounts that they provide MTS themselves, but that's not necessarily SANDAG driven. That's their discounts. I mean, we do pay for part of the uh, senior discount, senior disabled pass through the transnet funds, but all their other discounts is kind of based on their fares. See, basically what I'm getting at is I'm trying to figure out if uh, the transit system is operating the way it was proposed economically. That's right. So their overall their fare box recoveries and we will be presenting I think that the detailed statistics of all the, the um, right and we've done that we did that last year. <coughs> That's where that. we get and covered. we'll have the passengers per hour passengers per hour fare box recovery. Fare box recoveries for these are right within the normal range of MTS's uh, systems, and we'll show that to you more specifically at that uh, presentation. But no, they're, they're right. <coughs> I think actually a couple of these routes are actually above the MTS's median range, and uh, definitely well above their minimum fare box recovery thresholds that they have to have. Carolyn, we should add on the fare box piece when our transit operators benchmark against other transit properties. 
within the state or around the country that are you know, similar. Because I, I think on some of this, the broader answer to your question is, you know, land use matters, all right? So in downtown San Diego, we're probably going to move, you know, way more uh, number of trips on, on have the potential for a, a larger number of transit trips than we would in <coughs> Carolina, where you and I live, right, as a, right. As a deferential. But when our transit agencies benchmark against other properties, it's pretty typical that most properties have a fare box recovery that's somewhere in the teens. And, you know, San Diego historically has been in the 40 percent range, maybe a little higher than you know, somewhere in the 40s. And so we, we have already a pretty high fare box recovery. And I guess, you know, when we look at the models that we ran for some of the rapid <coughs> services that we put in, and, and I mean, those were some of the numbers that we highlighted here. Um, so far, we're, we're pleased to see that the, the numbers are where we forecast that they would be, and in most cases, they're above that. And in the one case, I think, um, uh, where they're not where we should be, we're working with MTS, and they're modifying the route, right? So the idea is then to try to be smart and not just run buses because we said we were going to run buses if the, if the numbers are not there. Uh, on, and Dave helped me a little bit. It's on uh, Mira Mesa, I think, where we uh, are making some adjustments the you know, time of days that the bus runs. And so I, I would just share with the committee that you know, I think both uh, both MTS and NCTD uh, have done a, a pretty good job in trying to you know, manage their, their, their operations. And uh, fare box recoveries, uh, San Diego is probably some of the highest in the country. Well, when we're looking at our debt for long term, I know that if we're not <coughs> paying for ourselves in the transit system when we go, then there is an extra expense that comes, I assume, out of Transnet dollars. Is that true? Well, I mean, so you look at some of these, I mean, some, some of the stuff gets funded out of TDA, right? So there's some stuff at the state level. And then the, the Transnet piece, you know, that's the stuff we went to the voters and we satisfied, <coughs> uh, what was it, 8.1%. Of the measure to be able to fund the operations piece. Uh, okay, and that's a, that. I guess my question is: Is that enough? Do you think? Well, I think what we're seeing right now is that based on our forecast, and there's lots of assumptions in the forecast, but we're within five percent, thirty-five years, and we think that it's reasonable that we can manage that five percent in the future without having to take drastic actions right now. But back to this plan of finance, this is the first time we've done one for operations, just like we've been historically doing them for years and years on the capital side. We think it's a good discipline to start doing what we're doing on I the agree. operations side. I so agree. Year by year, we'll look at this and hopefully we'll make adjustments. And how you would make adjustments is you, you know, may, if you get in trouble, you then either gotta raise fares or you gotta reduce services or you gotta find money someplace else. Right, that's why I just wanted to make sure everybody's uh, okay. In terms of marketing, um, we did market all the new services when they were first launched, so we branded them. There was a campaign called One Sweet Life. Um, MTS, because now they've taken these new services, they're part of the regular system, right? Um, they do have something on their board agenda for tomorrow um, to launch a new campaign to kind of, I mean, taking advantage of all the improvements that were done with Transnet. So recall we've done the trolley renewal, um, you know, significant investments in stations, vehicle, the local vehicles. So they're taking advantage of that and branding something and putting something out there in terms of, hey, we have new vehicles, we have new services, we have new stations. So I think the, the, the marketing of these services are still you know, ongoing and also rolled into the, their <coughs> Thank you. Best of Thank you. Two questions, hopefully they're very quick. Um, I heard somewhere that the service boundaries for the buses are legislated or defined somewhere. Is that accurate? What is that? There's service areas. Or yeah, there's service areas. Right. In, in the law. law. Which law. Is state? State law. Mm -hmm. How easily are those amended? Would require changes in state law. And then second, I see these nice photos and they're all MTS. Is NCTD, do they choose not to participate? Do they already have these programs? We don't see much about their bus services. I, I think the re 
reason we highlighted the stuff you see here is that the, so the, the BRTs, the new ones that we just added, have primarily been in the MTS area. Right. Uh, but actually, the first BRT we did in the region was the breeze that runs down uh, Bear Valley Parkway that's uh, actually performing pretty decently. And then you know, the Sprinter and the Toaster are the uh, two pieces. So you know, it's a little different operations. You know, the NCTD is more of a suburban operation where you know MTS is more an urban operation. But no, we we don't mean by not showing the uh, NCT. No, I, I guess I was more curious if they are actively involved. If they Absolutely. I, I think um, some of the stuff you mentioned just before my time on the uh, committee. So. Yeah, no, so they, they uh, participate with us uh, on, on a pretty regular basis. So yeah, and, and, and just to clarify that this pot of funds <coughs> is, is to provide operating funds for the new transnet services, uh, transnet <coughs> transit services. <coughs> so the, the first ones that we've started have just happen to be in the MTS service area, but there's other services that are in the uh, NCTD service area. So once those get implemented, then this pot of money would kick in for those services. Thank you. Now, uh, this is for a recommendation. Is that true? Yes. So we need a motion. This is sort of like asking your lawyer how much you're going to make in a lawsuit. <laughs> Thank you for the ranges. And I, I move that we, that we recommend a, a approval of some of the Carol? Okay. Great. I, I do want to say uh, this is a great report. Yes. I think uh, last year, I attend, like I said, I attended that, the board retreat. And I remember Dave, I think there was, you presented a video of staff members uh, doing various things on it. Transit related things. You you uh, you spoke on the video, I think, didn't you? And said that you right. rode, rode the tram. Do you, do you ride that uh, uh, trolley every day, or I ride transit probably seven days a week. Yeah, yeah. I have a car, but it sits in the garage. Well, no, that's time. great. Uh, yeah. That's, that's but I moved into an area where the transit was going to be, and I'm waiting for Mid Coast to uh, have an area that way. So oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Good job, Brian. Thank you very much. Um, if that said, all was fair. Yeah. Opposed? Yes, Ariane, right, we have a future meeting schedule. Uh, it's next Wednesday, February 10th, is that yes. it? And I have a draft agenda. I had a quick question on the status of the financial audit. I can't remember where we're at. The audit. status of the financial, financial audit. audit. Yeah, so the financial audit, typically we bring that to you with a, a draft of the, of the audit in March, at your March meeting. Okay, that's right. And remember, that's kind of a, a tight timeline. We have to hit certain milestones, milestones before the board, before you accept the draft. So that and then, and then uh, potential agenda item state the STIP funding strategies for I-5 North Force Corridor Project. Is that uh, uh, an item that's uh, depending on what you, where you're at, you would put that on the agenda? Yeah, that's a potential that item that we're waiting to hear from. As we mentioned, the California Transportation Commission is going to be discussing that and possibly taking action at their meeting this week. Great. And then uh, next, we, next month we'll do the, uh, the budget for us for 2017. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. That'll be a good agenda. So, is that any other comments? Everybody? So, that's it. All we're doing. Everybody on schedule. Huh?